All right. Get my microphone situated here. And then we will be ready to roll. I think that works. Um, let me do an audio check real quick. All right, we've got audio. Heidi ho, internet friends. Welcome to my shop. I'm Jeff, and this is JR's Wood Shop, as the sign says down below. And uh, what is today? Today is Monday. We've got a brand new Monday, a brand new start of the week. And um, hopefully everybody had a great weekend. Hopefully you got some shop time. And uh, I, I'm cleaning my glasses because every time I sit down, I've got one light right here. And it shines right in my face, which, you know, is a good thing in, in terms of lighting things up. But um, it also highlights how dirty my glasses are. And so I have to take a moment to clean them because otherwise all I see is like smudgy sh kind of blobs. So cleaning glasses, good thing. And that way I can see. But I don't normally do that until I sit down and then I've got the light in my face. Otherwise, I don't necessarily notice. Uh, all right. So what did I do this weekend? It's a good question. Uh, what did I do this weekend? Um, I did some bits and bobs and little things. Some stuff takes longer. Like I'm working on these boards. I've almost got these things done. I mean, I'm so close to getting these serving trays done. These, I did three of them. Two of them are finished in their curing in my house. They're just sitting in there. Well, one of them's pretty well done. Another one, might need an additional coat of uh, finish on it. Jury's still out, I'll check it. Um, it's still just a, it's a little tacky. It's not curing up the way I want it to. Um, so I might have to just do a, a little quick scuff sand on there and then hit it with just a, an un, uh, no mineral oil in the finish, just a straight uh, salad bowl finish on there and then let that dry. Uh, this one, I had some spots on here where this is the one, if you've been following along, this one right here had all these little holes that were from the pith of the piece of walnut that I had there. And I filled them all. And, and on the back, you can see, hopefully, that they filled really nicely, especially on the back. I actually did an epoxy fill on these because there was so much volume to fill that I actually had to use an epoxy to fill these. So all along here, these little circles, I don't know if you can see those or not. I think you can. Um, there you go. So you can see all those little dots right there. And there's another row of them on this side. So right there. Um, so they got filled on the back, but in the top, they were a little harder to fill because there were, you know, areas that I carved and there was also some cracks and stuff like that. So I've kind of been going at this for a while, I, I, I filled them from the top with the epoxy, and most of them are good. Um, but there were a couple that just, so problem is when you pour epoxy, even though I use a needle and poke down through the holes to get it to settle, um, every now and then, you know, there's air bubbles that get trapped. And then over time, as it's curing, those air bubbles kind of rise to the surface, and then the, the epoxy that looked like it was full kind of sinks down into the hole, and then you're kind of left with, these depressions on top of the holes. <clears throat> so I've been trying to fill those along with a couple little cracks in the surface. And even though this is not a cutting board made for, you know, cutting food and stuff on there, so you don't have to worry too much about bacteria and stuff, I still want it to be sealed and I want it to be um, flush and flat on the top, not have these little depressions in there. So I went back uh, with some CA glue. I've got the black medium thick CA glue and went back and kind of hit those spots and then had to go and then sanded it off and then some of them were still a little low. And so I think I've got the last group now where um, I hit them one more time with a little bit of black CA and I've sprayed them with the little activator so that it's, it's dry on top. The CA is not going to get me, but I need to let that set for a little bit longer and then try to get that um, sanded down. So that's flush, and then, then I can put finish on this thing. So that's all this is lacking is some finish. And then once I get the finish off on and cures, then I'll come back and put some feet on these things. So the other two do not have feet yet. They need feet as well. But I have feet um, in my drawer over there, so I'll put some feet on them. And 
So that's, that's where I'm at on this project. It's getting really super close. So two of them have finished. This one needs a little bit of sanding to get that, those hopefully flattened down and, and ready to go. And then I can put the first coat of finish on this. It's usually two coats. I put one coat on, let it sit for a day, and you soak it in really well so it soaks into the wood fibers and really creates a, a barrier. Um, that's the nice thing about the salad bowl finish and you thin it with mineral spirits is it soaks in. Um, it's very watery, soaks right into the wood fibers on the end grain, really creates a barrier in there and gives a lot of protection to the wood. But, um, you know, is this on? I hate it when it does this. Hang on. Okay, that's not on. So if I have my VPN on, um, it, it starts doing this repeat chats. Welcome to the chat room. Welcome. It just, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, Twitch doesn't get along with the VPN very well. So I'm going to move this over here. And anyway, so I've got all of that going on uh, with these boards. So pretty getting close to the end. They don't really have a home. I haven't figured out who's going to get them yet. I'm not selling them. They're just for a, uh, you know, gifts to have around. And it was just something I wanted to do. It was more to try some different stuff. Um, one of the things that I actually started doing with these was the, uh, the alcohol ink printing on the ceramic tiles, which is very crafty. It's a very craft thing to do. But I thought it looked really great and it was just better than just plain ceramic tiles. And so I started playing with those and found uh, somewhere on the internet, watching YouTube, which is where we find everything, I found a really cool technique for painting backgrounds. Um, so if you look at this one, oops, got a little dust on there. Um, just a, a really cool kind of a, a modeled look to it. Um, but anyway, I, I just love the way this looks. And I, uh, I found this technique using basically a, um, an ink blotter uh, with felt on the, it's basically a blotter with felt on the bottom. And I made, a, I made one, so I had a piece of felt and I glued it to the bottom of this thing. You can see that's actually was yellow felt on there. So you can see all the inks kind of soaked in. So I made this little stamper and I used some really heavy like uh, 90, I think it was number 90 uh, spray adhesive, which is like the super duper adhesive spray. <laughs> um, so I tried to pull this off and it was like, nope, you are on there forever. So I can't really replace that pad, which kind of sucks. I hadn't thought about that, but I think I have some milder adhesive, like the 45, um, which is less temporary or le more temporary, less permanent. But I said, you know, I can always just make another handle. So I did. I made another handle, and I've actually can make a couple of them. I cut out some blocks. Basically, I had some. <laughs> this is leftover pallet wood. So this was uh, wood from a pallet. Uh, and it's pine, and if I smell it, yeah, it's whoo, it's got that treated pine smell. Um, less outdoorsy, more, it's just got that pine smell, you know, that heavy pine smell. But anyway, I put this on my lathe and turned a little, little pad. And what I'm going to do with this is put a piece of Velcro on the bottom. So I went out and bought some Velcro. So I'm going to put some Velcro on the bottom of this thing. And then um, I bought some little, there's a two little, I don't know how big these are. Like, I don't know. What is that? Eight and a half by 11, eight by 10 sheets of, uh, of felt. So this is just white felt. But that means that I could hopefully put a piece of the, the hook and loop, um, usually the hook part of the, of the Velcro, I can attach that to the bottom of this. And then I can easily attach a piece of Velcro cut down to size and put that on there. And then when I'm done doing the stampy things, I take the Velcro, I take the pad off the, the felt pad. I can cut a new one, put it on there and I have a clean felt pad. So I made this handle. So I turned this on my lathe. Um, I don't, I haven't done lathe stuff in a while, but anyway, I did this just really quickly on my lathe and, um, so you don't need a lathe to do this. This one I actually did on my bandsaw, the one over here on the left. Um, I did this one on my bandsaw. 
and kind of just rounded it off a little bit. And uh, it's actually kind of cool looking. I kind of like the way it turned out. It looks like a pawn, right? A little bit. But um, so you don't need to have a lathe to do something like this. Um, I didn't even need to do this. I could have just used a block of wood. Um, but you know, it's kind of nice to have the handle. Um, so I just hadn't used my lathe in a while. And I had my lathe set up because it's kind of the other thing I did this weekend, which I need to finish. And I'll show you that. Um, so I'd gotten these things a while ago. So this is a, uh, a Narex. Um, I can't. Bistrusis. Bistrus. Bistris. I, I don't know. It's, it's Czechoslovakian. I don't speak Czech. But what it is, is a, an awl. A-W-L. Awl. And this one is a pyramidal, a pyramidal um, point. And this one right here is a conical point. And I, it, it's basically a kit. So it basically comes with, I'll show you the kit here. It's a super simple kit, but I didn't have an awl. I had no awl. So if I wanted to center punch something, you know, or, or make an indent or scribe or do something, um, I always had to grab like a nail or a screw or something like that. Um, I didn't have anything that I could use. So basically this comes with the awl itself and it's just a nice piece of steel with a, I'll take it out of the thing here so you can see, um, put it on there, over my hand so you can see the point there. So this thing has the pyramidal one um, and it's just down to a super, super nice point. And then it comes with a little ferrule right here. There's a little, I don't know, I won't call it brass, it's probably tin or something like that. But anyway, it has a little, a little ferrule and this is just in a little protector right here so that you don't get poked. But anyway, I bought two of these in kits, one with a pyramidal and one with a conical head. And they've been sitting in my drawer for months now. And all they needed was a handle. And I don't know why, but I just hadn't gotten around to it. So for whatever reason, I was just digging in a drawer and I found these and I was like, oh man, you know what? Let me make a handle. So that's what I did this weekend as well, is I made this which is a little piece of walnut that I put on my lathe and made a really nice little handle for this. And then you can see the, uh, the ferrule goes over this little section right here. Um, so this is turned a little thinner, the ferrule fits over that, and that just provides some sturdiness to the end right here so it doesn't crack and split, kind of holds it in place. <laughs> Excuse me. So the only thing I need to do on this, you can see it's not attached yet. So I need to, put some um, epoxy on here and just epoxy this in place. So that's one of the things I'm gonna do this morning. I've got some Gorilla Glue epoxy right here. So I'm gonna put some epoxy on here and we will make that a thing. And uh, I'm going to, so I'm gonna epoxy this in place. I mean, it's five minute epoxy, that just takes me a minute. But anyway, that's kind of one of my little things I need to do. But yeah, I just turned on my lathe. I haven't used my lathe in a while. Um, so there's my lathe sitting over there. I've got a small lathe. It's just a, uh, it's a Nova Comet 2. And I got that a few years ago. It's really, really nice. Um, I use it for making pens, uh, small turning projects. I mean, I've turned lots of bowls and things like that. It doesn't have a ton of clearance. So I can't do anything huge on there. And it doesn't have a, a really big motor on there. Uh, my brother has a a huge lathe. He got one from Grizzly that's huge and he makes big platters and kind of, he does some beautiful work. Um, I just use mine for really small stuff. Um, I also have a spindle that I put on there that has buffing wheels. So I would use that to buff uh, metal parts and plastic parts and things like that. Um, but anyway, it's a great little lathe. Uh, it's really nice. I think it, there's usually the Comets run about 500 bucks or so and then you need some tools. So I actually have a cool set of tools. Uh, I, well, I got a couple sets of tools. I've got some, I'll go over here and show you my tools real quick. I actually made a, I made this whole table. Let me uh, zoom it out so you can see my table here. It's kind of a mess, but uh, show you kind of a cool feature of the table is I've got these drawers down here. Let's not be crooked. So I made these drawers in the table and these are specifically for holding tools. So you can see that they're actually, there's no bottom to them. And that's so that if you're using it, you just leave these out and then the tools will sit in here and any dust falls through and doesn't collect in, any, in a drawer bottom. 
So I've got these set of Rockler. Um, these are carbide tips. So I've got a square, a round, and then the little pyramid one, the little diamond shaped point. So those are nice, especially if you're doing pin work. If you're making pins, you know, turning pin blanks, um, these little small tools are really nice. They've got ash handles and then a rubber handle on the back. So I got these at Rockler, they're really nice. And then I have just a set of, you know, kind of the whole set right here, which is another, you know, these were cheapy. I don't even know who makes things, but you know, you've got regular gouges. You've got a big gouge and a small gouge and a really teeny gouge. And then you know, I've got a couple of skews in here. These are, they're okay. I've got a bull nose um, and then a little diamond, like a, a separator right there, um, a, a parter. Um, so anyway, I've got those right there and then, and that, but that's, I made that and then I've got my little grinder on the top here so I can sharpen my stuff. I've got the little thing right here that you can use to, to sharpen all your skews and stuff. And then I have a couple of, well, this, this is a beauty. This is a Robert Sorby. So this is a, um, a bowl scraper. So this is really nice. This is, this is stout. It is a heavy puppy right here, but this is beautiful. So if you're doing bowls and stuff, this scraper is ooh, sharp, um, is really, really nice. And it gives you a really clean, clean surface. This is a pinnacle. Um, this is my really nice skew right here. It's got a fingernail carve on the front. So this is a really nice, and it's a little bit bigger. It gives you a little bit more. Um, you can put it on your hip while you're turning and stuff. So it gives you a little bit more, um, I don't know, mass to work with. Um, and then what else do I have here? And then I've got a couple of, um, these I made myself from a kit. You can, it, they'll send you the, the steel here and then this has a round carbide bit on it. And then I made the handle. So that's an ash handle for this one. And then I've got one more that has the square face. Boop. So that's this one right here. So once again, I made the handle out of ash. It's really pretty and stout and feels really great. I think this is about three to four inches inside of the handle. So it does a really good job. Um, and I bought these little ferrules. These are brass tubing that you buy at the hardware store. So these are nice. And this has a square carbide tip on there. So I've got the big square and a big circle. Um, I can't remember where I bought those, but, uh, and then I've got a little teeny Robert Sorby, um, little, I can't remember what you call these things, but uh, it's just basically, um, you know, to separate your piece, you can make cuts on this. So this is really nice too. So that's a Sorby. Um, but anyway, that's my, uh, that's my lathe. And I built the table specifically for the lathe. Um, cause I'm a tall guy. So that actually is kind of tall off the ground. Most people would not be comfortable turning on that, on that particular stand because, um, it's probably a little tall for most people, but I'm six, five. So for me, it's kind of nice. A lot of lathe stands are a little low for me. So anyway, that is my lathe. So I broke out the lathe this weekend and turned this little handle right here. I have to turn another one for this, for this one, but uh, I, got, I can't remember. I think I paid 10 bucks for these kits. Um, I got it from the same place that I got the, um, the kit for making my, uh, let me see if I can find it here. Where'd I put it? For um, I can't find it. my marking gauge, um, I, I got the marking gauge and I've got the, uh, the two awls from the same place. And I'm trying to remember where that was. Um, if I remember, I'll, I'll, I'll shout it out later. But anyway, that's, uh, that's what I got. And those are really nice. I'm really happy with those. So let me, let me pull this up here. Boom. There we go. Anyway, so I did some lathe turning, uh, made a handle, made a stamp. I'm going to turn that into a stamp here in a minute because I haven't tested that yet. I'm going to spray it with the adhesive and put the Velcro on and do that. Um, anything else that I did this weekend? That may be it. It could be. Uh, yeah. So that's, I'm going to finish this up. I'm going to do uh, a little Velcro here in a second because not Velcro. I'm going to do some Velcro. I've got Velcro on the brain. I'm going to do some epoxy on here. And uh, I also was at Walmart where I got the felt 
and they got these little sticks. They're called skinny sticks, but these things are perfect for, uh, they're really thin and they're perfect for mixing and doing stuff. And I thought, you know, everybody needs some skinny sticks. So I got these to just throw in my drawer over here and keep, uh, let's see. I'm gonna go ahead and do the, uh, I'm gonna get this all in place. Cause like I said, it's just five minute epoxy. It sets in five minutes. Uh, I'm gonna find a scrap of something that I can do this on so that I don't mess up anything good. And I've got so much of this plywood sitting around here. I've got so much plywood. I'm just gonna get some of this plywood. It's just a little piece of scrap ply. And I have so much of it that I don't need. So I'm going to take that and put it um, right here. And we're just going <clears> to <throat> take the awl out, and take the ferrule off. And what I need to do is just basically put some of the epoxy in the hole and put some around the outside here where the ferrule goes. And yeah, that's it. This has been finished. I use, there's a turning finish that I use for putting on here. Um, for the walnut, it's a really nice finish. Let me see what it's called. Um, I use it, it's called Hut Crystal Coat, and it just puts a nice protective coating on the outside. You basically get the whole thing smeared while it's still on the lathe, so it's spinning, and you put some on a rag, and you get it, you just turn it and get it covered, and then you crank the lathe up and get the speed going really fast, and then it basically just kind of like the heat really kind of sets the, the finish on there and gives it this really nice protective finish. But it feels very natural and it's not super shiny, it's just got a nice luster to it. Kind of a nice polished luster. All right, let's, I uh, think I've already opened this once before. So I'm going to pop the end off here. Yeah. And then we are going to mix up a little epoxy here, hopefully. Oh, come on, I need the other side to go. There we go. You need both sides, and I only got it going up one side here. Okay, that's way too much epoxy, but for whatever reason, it didn't want to come. Couldn't get the, whatever the yellow side is, I couldn't get that to behave itself. And now I've got it everywhere. Uh, you know, it's the thing with epoxy, it just gets on stuff. It's like, even when you're trying to be careful and stuff, it just, for whatever reason, it just finds a way to get on your fingers. All right, put the lid on there. And I'm trying not to let it get on my fingers. And it stinks too. But anyway, I'm just gonna mix this up and get the hardener and the epoxy all mixed together. There we go. And let that get set. And I'll just use my little skinny stick to apply some into the hole where we're gonna put the shaft of this bad boy. This is, and these are roughed up on the end, which is kind of nice. They're already, the steel, it's smooth on this end towards the point, but on this end, it's already been kind of roughed up so that it is ready for epoxy. Cause that's the thing, you don't wanna do it just on the smooth. It has nothing to bite and hold into. So if you rough it up a little bit, um, the epoxy has some little teeth to hold on to, <clears throat> but they've already done that for me, which is really super nice. I might need a toothpick for this though. That might be a little better. Toothpick might be a good call for this just because I need to get it down in the hole. Let me see. Yeah, because getting it in the hole here might be a little bit more difficult. Uh, you know, I need to get some toothpicks to keep them here in the shop. That's probably what I need to do. If I do have some, hang on, let me go grab a toothpick <clears throat> out of my kitchen. Kind of handy having the kitchen close by because you can sort of grab things out of here as you need them. I'm sure my wife doesn't appreciate that, but you know, every now and then you need to raid the kitchen for a toothpick or something. Beverage snack and it's all right here within easy reach all right so i got a toothpick and that's just so i can get some of this epoxy down into well, i got several toothpicks but 
I'm going to get some of this epoxy down inside of the uh, cavity here. And the toothpick just makes that a little easier. And this is pretty deep. Um, I went about two inches deep on the drill um, when I made the hole for this. I drill the hole first before I actually do any of the uh, work on the lathe. And then the hole actually is where I put the conical um, end piece for the lathe. I'm sure it has a more technical name, but I can't remember. It's the center. So the conical center, it's a free spinning center. And I put that on the, uh, in the hole here to keep it centered. Okay. I'm trying to remember, I think I did, just did this one on a, uh, an end center. Okay. That should be good for that. I'm going to use my little skinny here to put some, Epoxy on the outside where the ferrule is going to go. I hope I'm saying that right. I believe it's a ferrule. But, uh, anyway, I'm just going to get that coated. And then I'll put this all together. And then hopefully this will all set up and be ready for use. I'm just thinking I just need a little bit more epoxy in the hole here. If it pops out the end, that's okay. I can always just wipe it off. All right. But I do want to, I'm just wiping it all around the inside of that hole just to make sure there's a coat on the inside. I'm wondering if I should put the ferrule on first. I think I'm going to. And then that's going to push epoxy off the end. So I need to wipe that off. I'm trying to keep epoxy off of the handle itself and off of my fingers. I don't know how successful I will be. Not very. All right. And now I will put the just shove that in there and it should be a little epoxy. Oh, that's a nice fit. Nice fit. All right. So there we go. Now I'll just let this sit. I'm actually going to let it sit like this because I don't want the epoxy to just drip to the bottom of the hole. I want it to be set up all on the insides. And now I just have this giant pool of epoxy, which I'm going to set off to the side so it can harden before I throw it away. And then we will call that done. Um, let's see. Now what will we do? Well, let's see. I'm going to put a pad on here. I'm just going to do my little projects now <laughs> and get them out of the way. And this is one of those little projects that I wanted to finish up. This has no coating on it or treatment or anything. Like I said, I had this block of, I've got all these big pieces of um, uh, pine that came from a pallet. Whew, stinky. Um, but I, I, I had uh, found a pallet. It was made of, instead of like really thin pallet wood, it had some really chunky, this thing was from a heavy piece of machinery or whatever that was shipped somewhere. So it had really, really heavy pieces of pine on the bottom. And I cut a bunch of those off. Oh, so sad face. While I was doing that, I was milling one side down flat. So I was making these kind of really flat so that I could get them all square and cut up flat. And yeah, I had missed a nail in there. So while I was running across my jointer, I nicked my jointer blade. That is super sad. Um, if you've ever nicked your jointer blade, oh, look at that, it works actually really well. Ooh, I like that. Um, yeah, so I nicked my jointer blade, which means I gotta replace my jointer blades. Um, and that is not fun. I got to go find some first that'll fit my joiner, which shouldn't be a huge deal. And there's six and an eighth inch blades, but um, I need to get that. I need to go find some and then I need to replace them and replacing them is kind of a pain in the butt because I have straight blades. So what happens is if you've got a straight blade on a joiner, it's, it's this round little drum that they insert into. And you need to get the, that blade perfectly flat and flush 
with the outfeed table because as you feed it through, you want that flatness to be carved and then ride along the outfeed table. So you have to have those perfectly, perfectly in line with that outfeed table. So um, the guy that I bought this, lay, this, lay, this jointer from made these tools. I don't know where they are and I gotta find them. So he made this tool or tools, which was basically a piece of metal with two magnets on the bottom of it, or three magnets, I think there were three magnets on it. And there were two of them. So they would basically sit on the outfeed table, the two magnets on one end and then one magnet on the other end. And the two magnets would hold it really flat to that outfeed table. And then it extended out over top of the, um, the blade, of the little blade, spindle, drum, whatever you want to call it. And the little single magnets would then hold the blade right up against the, well, the blade would sit and be held by that, those magnets. The, the, the very cutting edge of that blade is held by the magnets. And because those magnets are set to the same height as the two magnets behind it, um, you would get a very perfect level for that blade and you tighten the screws down and Bob's your uncle. But I can't find those little things. I've looked everywhere. I can't find the little magnet things. So I've got to scour my shop for these two little magnet things that hold, I'm looking for them. They sh I mean, I can't find them anywhere. And I need to find them because that's the only way that I can set the blades for this thing. Um, I mean, you can try to do it other ways, but uh, I'm gonna tell you that it is next to impossible to do. So those things are somewhere in my shop. I gotta find them. Um, and I, I've looked around. I need to do a deep dive into my shop and find those so that I can replace those blades. I don't have the blades yet. I still need to get the blades as well. But anyway, that is what I need to do. Um, I'm gonna cut this Velcro. So I bought these large pieces of Velcro um, from Walmart and these are, what are they? Three inch or, or four inch by two inch strips. So they're wider than what I need, but uh, they're longer than what I need. So you can see, there you go. So here's the little Velcro strips I bought and you can see that my pad, it'll fit nicely. I just need to trim this down. So I'm gonna find, once again, another piece of scrap. I'm just the king of using my scrap today. And this little plywood scrap comes in real handy. And I'm also gonna get a, uh, a razor, well, sort of a razor, an X-Acto blady thing that I think I've got here to cut this with, or try to cut this, so I can put this on here. Now this is um, adhesive backed, so I may not need to use the spray to put on here. Um, I may or may not need that. So I'm gonna try to cut this uh, without it being, I'm not gonna, without it being adhered to this because I want to keep as much of this intact. So I'm just going to kind of scribe a line on here gently like this, just so I can sort of see it. And then I can come back and maybe uh, use a ruler to finish this. Or I can just do it this way. That may actually have it here. Yeah. Now, the nice thing is you know, I've got this long strip on the side here. I can always come back and use this piece and if I have more than one and kind of double them up. So I will keep this. I also have the loop section of the hook and loop. Although this is actual real Velcro. Um, but I, won't, I don't need the loop part. So I don't know if I'll ever need that or not, but um, I'm going to, this has an adhesive back, so I'm going to check the adhesive on here. If it's not good enough, I will go ahead and uh, use my spray adhesive because it's crazy good. But anyway, let's try the adhesive on here first, and this is already kind of clean. And we're just going to put this on here, like so, and just kind of smush that down. All right. 
So there is my little stamper with the bottom on there with the Velcro. And that should allow me to take a piece of, uh, piece of felt and I'm just gonna put this down lightly here because I wanna mark and just cut this off. So I'm just gonna get a pencil and just make a little pencil mark on here just so I can use a pair of scissors to cut this off. It might be a little easier that way. I barely see my line, but let's see if my scissors are a piece of junk and don't wanna cut this. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Jeez, is that, yeah. I thought my pencil mark didn't do very well on here, I can tell you that. Let me try that again. Just kinda... Pencil, work. Yeah, sorta. Anyway, the nice thing is I can take these and, um, well, if I can cut this, you know what? I'm sitting here with a razor blade, I'm just gonna use that. And I'm gonna use, a straight edge, let's try that. Try a straight edge and a ruler, and that might be a little bit more effective here. Well, it's, this is why they make these little cutting wheels to cut fabric and stuff for people who sew, because they just do a better job of cutting. But anyway, ah, I think I got it. There we go, look, a little white piece of felt. And I should be able to press that into here. And there it is. So there we go, made one of those, kind of fun. And then when I'm done, I can peel this off like that and just put a new one on. And now I have a reusable pad for doing ink pressing with my alcohol inks. So yay, <laughs> that's probably kind of nice. <clears throat> oh, I have, hang on, I got a little bit of Epoxy on the outside of this. I just found it. I do not want any epoxy on the handle. Although, I mean, I guess it wouldn't be horrible if there was a little epoxy on the handle. It wouldn't hurt it. But I just don't want any on there. All right. So we got the all done. Boom. We have the, uh, the ink pad done, which was really nice. Um, I need to turn another handle. I don't, I'm not going to turn a handle this morning, but I need to turn another handle because I don't have a camera set up. If I had a camera set up over on my, uh, on my lathe, I would absolutely do that. Problem is, it's located way over there. My computer is way over here. Um, all of my cameras are kind of around my workbench. The only thing I could do is maybe, and I don't know if I have enough cable, like because everything comes into here. So all of my cameras come into this thing right? So they all kind of need to be within proximity and have a, um, a cable long enough to do... I wonder if my main camera could see that. Because um, I'm just... I need to turn a handle for my other lathe. And I have a piece of walnut already set up to do that. Uh, I cut walnut blocks out of some scrap. So I had a piece of scrap walnut that I'd used from making, I don't know, I think I, from making the, the boards over here. And uh, it's nice and thick. It's about an inch and a quarter thick, which is a pretty good size for making the handles. I really didn't take the size down uh, much when I was carving this. I mostly just rounded the, the ends of it. And then I, I knocked down that edge until that ferrule just fit on top of there. Um, but I have another one of these cut. I think it's over at the table over here. Um, I could do that. I just don't have like a, you know, a lot, a lot of people who do this have like a, a top down camera where it's like, oh, here, look, I've got a camera mounted up. But that's all they do is, or mostly what they do is lathe turning. And I do so much stuff all around my shop that it didn't make, and I don't do a lot of lathe turning. It just didn't make sense for me to have a camera set up over my lathe, um, and I don't have the uh, the cable length for the HDMI cables to really support that. Let me see how long this cable is real quick here. 
Um, tut, 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 tut. Yeah, see, tut, tut, tut. Um, and I'm trying to see if I'm right here in line with my camera. Could I see that? I might be in the way because <laughs> I stand in front of it, and that's the problem. Unless I'm like got a camera right off to my side, you really wouldn't see anything, and that would not be helpful. Let me see where that block is, though. I should have another block over here of uh, walnut that was ready to go. Uh, I don't know where I put that though, which is interesting because I'd already glued or I already glued, I already made a hole in it for the purpose of inserting. And now I can't even find that piece, which is not great. Um, that's the problem with little scraps of wood though, is they kind of get pushed around in my shop and then I can't find them I'm looking all around. I thought I brought it over here to the lathe, but I can't find it. So, hmm. Oh, here it is. Found it. So this is what I started with for my handle is this little piece right here. And so I've already got a center punch mark on there and I already drilled a center. There you go. So I drilled a hole in the center and that will be for the, uh, the all handle to go into. And then I've got a little center punch mark here that I will drive my, uh, my other end of my lathe into that will actually spin this. I really should learn the names of the pieces, but I don't use it that often. And it's like, it's not that I don't know how to use my lathe. I just don't, I just don't know what the pieces are called anymore. I was really into my lathe for a while and I just haven't used that lathe very much. So anyway, all right, I'm gonna put this aside because I don't want the felt to get messy. Um, the other thing is that I will probably use these for my kids, my girls, my, my youngins, that will probably really enjoy using the stamper and doing some really creative stuff with this because it really is very cool to do this. Um, it's, you can just make some really interesting stuff. In fact, I need to make one more. I made this one. I've got one more and I need one for this tray right here. I don't have one yet, so I need to make one for that. Should I do that now? I mean, I've got so many little things to do. Um, I want to set this stuff aside. Let me get this stuff out of the way. I'm going to put the epoxy away. And uh, the problem is that... Uh, oh, I wonder if my son went to work. It does not look like it. All right, I'm going to pause the microphone here real quick. And yell at my son. Okay, sorry, I had to mute my mic because I had to yell at my son. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to paint because, you know what, I've got other things to do that are wood shoppy things. We need to do some wood shop stuff. Doggone it. But this is really cool. I'm going to set this aside for a moment. I don't want this to get broken. So I'm going to set this one in my little storage over here where I've got the others. And I still need to get the top spray for that stuff. There's a lot of debate on the interwebs on how to preserve that. Um, the one thing that everybody agrees on is that you need to use a UV coating because these are pigment stains, not dye stains. And pigment stains uh, are affected by UV. So over time they will fade and lose their, their brilliance and their vividness. So if you, if you, there's a, you top coat it and then you coat that on top of that with a couple of coats of a UV, a clear UV um, blocking spray. Um, and then you can apply a gloss coat or something like a glaze or something on top of that. So there's, there's a lot of different um, discussions on the internet about the proper way to finish like a tile like this, although this is a really disgusting looking one. Um, because you want to put something on here that, first of all, doesn't reactivate your inks. 
because if you remember, these are alcohol and you don't want anything with a solvent because that'll reactivate them and make them run and look not great. Um, the other thing is that um, you need to protect it from UV and then you need something to be glossy and protect the top of that. Uh, the other thing is that they are not really great for heat, so you wouldn't use one of these next to your oven to put pots on because, or maybe hot mugs of coffee because that might not be great. Um, the one thing I have seen, so some people had some discussions about your last coat. If you get the automotive, um, the high heat automotive clear coat, that that's a good option as your final coat because then it provides heat protection. So people could put something hot on there because that stuff is made to sit on engines and such. So it, you can get some very high heat protection. So that is one suggestion for, for finishing these things. But there are people who say like, you know, they spend more time or as much time putting a finish coat, their final finish coats on top of their artwork than they do actually creating the artwork. Um, which tells you something, um, but you know, it's no, gr it's no good making a piece of art that people can screw up damage or whatever. You want it to be set and not, not be damaged and go away. Just checking. I think I've got to look here quick. Okay. It's, I had some messages pop up yoga for hip mobility. I need some hip mobility. My hips are awful. I have awful hip mobility. I'm going to put this pad, these two pads away because I will use them, but I don't want them to get dusty, dirty, messed up. So I'm going to put those away. I think I already put the felt away. I have uh, cleaned up as much as I'm going to clean up. And my, let's see how my, Ooh, that's almost set up. It's been more than five minutes. So this, Yep, it's pretty much set and ready to use. So, all. I'm in awe of my all. It's really, it really is nice. Um, Narex makes some really, really nice tools. Um, they make, you can buy Narex chisels. Um, let me look here. I'm going to look real quick online here. Uh, they make Narex chisels that are pretty reasonably priced. Let's see if I can, yeah, classic bevel edge chisels. They have a whole set here at uh, Lee Valley Tools, but you can buy them in other places as well. Um, but they're made in Czechoslovakia and these are some of the highest rated, like if, you're, if you can't afford Japanese chisels, which who can because they're ridiculous, um, these things run about 13 bucks a piece. They're not, uh, they're not crazy expensive. Um, and you can get them in different widths from a quarter of an inch all the way up to a, a two inch wide chisel, which that's, that's a hefty chisel. You can buy a whole set, um, quarter inch to two inch. That'll run you 142 bucks, but that gets you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 chisels. Um, and these things are, like I said, these are very, very highly reviewed, um, are they well reviewed? Um, well reviewed? Um, anyway, they receive high marks in the reviews. Um, everybody I know who does chisel work, you know, they're all got their Japanese, but they're like, if you can't use Japanese, get an Eryx. So these are some of the best chisels uh, you can buy for the money. They've got bench chisels, um, but Narex just makes some amazing chisels. And these, uh, these little punches are same company. It's all, it's a Czech company and these things are fantastic. I love these things. Uh, let's see if they make anything else. They make, uh, so they make bench chisels. Um, trying to see what else they make. They make an adzis, which is like a wood thing. They make some, uh, uh, spoon carving chisels and things like that are spoon carving knives. So they make spoon carving knives and such. Uh, Lee Valley Tools is a really great place to look um, and shop for stuff like that. So uh, check them out. I don't know who else would carry Narex. Um, I know Lee Valley does and they they carry a lot of great like high-end hand planes and stuff like that. I'm trying to find, let's see if there's another 
reseller of Narex. Oh no, I went too far. No, go back. <laughs> um, uh, oh, you can buy them on Amazon. So there you go. Amazon does carry some of them. Um, let me see. I'm going to click the old shopping link in Google and see what's, what they say. Uh, do, do, do. So Lee Valley, Amazon, Woodcraft. Does they sell it? No, they've got the Shibano Umekis, which... Okay, so be careful when you're buying chisels that you're buying what you think you're buying. Um, I think... Um, now, I love Woodcraft. Don't get me wrong. Woodcraft is a great store. They carry great stuff. But sometimes there, it's a little deceiving. Um, so sometimes they'll carry stuff and you'll think it's like, oh, it's this Japanese handsaw or whatever. And they just use some Japanese name on their saw. It's not necessarily a made in Japan kind of thing. So just, just, just look and see, because they do have their own brands. But this looks to be, um, if you want a Japanese set, are these made in Japan? Yeah, so they actually do. Um, they do have a set of of uh, Japanese chisels. So a set of Japanese chisels. So here's a comparison, though. I told you that Narex chisel set that went from quarter inch to two inch, right? Was 150 bucks. We'll just call it 150 bucks. A Shibano Shibano Umeki chisel set, ten piece. So I think it's the same number of chisels, which runs. Um, I think they, let me see what the details on these are from, uh, it's not telling me what the, the chisel range is, but it looks like about quarter inch to 10 to two inch. And that set costs 1300 bucks. That's why people love the Narex chisels because they're really fantastic chisels that are not going to bust your bank account. Um, Japanese chisels are awesome. Um, I have used them. I do not own them and they are beautiful. The thing about Japanese chisels, a lot of them is that they get super, super sharp, but their steel is more brittle. So you, you, you wouldn't use it like for severe chopping. You use it for really fine pairing and things like that. That's where the Japanese chisels are really, really nice. Um, but anyway, I also have a set of, of I've got some, I won't call them jank. I like my chisels. Um, I can find some. I've got these Irwin set right here. These Irwin chisels. Uh, these are the Irwin marples. My wife got me these for Christmas one year. These things are great. I love these things. Um, they super hard steel. Takes a while to get them sharp. Um, but yeah, like this is a three quarter, 19 mil. Um, and these things are great. I've also got a couple of odd sized chisels here, some short ones and some other stuff. So I've kind of acquired some chisels over time. These are really nice bench chisels, these Irwins. I've got no problem using these things, recommending them. They are really, really nice. So you can get decent chisels. <clears throat> the, the thing about chisels is how much time you have to put into sharpening them and keeping them sharp and how long they hold an edge because that's the other thing is you want your chisels to hold an edge. Um, and the Japanese chisels hold an edge really well, but the edge is more brittle. Um, so you can break it and have to resharpen it and stuff. And a lot of the chisels also from Japan are um, uh, hollow points. So basically the, the, the underside of the chisel part is hollowed out. And so basically most of the steel is around the edge. But that means as you use it over the years, you'll be getting closer and closer to that hollow and you won't have a flat front anymore. Um, whereas a chisel like the Irwin or whatever, you can keep sharpening that thing for decades and just keep moving up. Um, but anyway, chisels are interesting and, and it's one of those, so there's people who just deep dive into chisels. I'm not one of them. I just like stuff that works. So anyway, Narex, getting back to the point. If you want some really good chisels, if you want a complete chisel set from quarter to two inch, 150 bucks gets you a set of Narex chisels. And you know what? You can't really go wrong with that. Um, and they make them in different sizes and sets and stuff. You can get a set of seven for $87. Um, but here's a set of six for 134. I, I don't understand how this works with the, the whole pairing of sizes and such. But uh, anyway, get yourself some good chisels. Um, and then here's the problem with good chisels 
you have to get yourself a good sharpening system because they need to be sharpened and you can't just buy chisels and expect them to work. I mean, they might be pretty sharp out of the box, but they're going to need sharpening. You're going to have to flatten the back. Hey, buddy. Have a good one. But you're going to have to flatten the backs of them. You're going to have to flatten. You're going to have to, you know, put an edge on them. You're going to need to hone it and all the other stuff. So you're going to need some sort of system to do that. So it's kind of like you, you're not just buying chisels. You have to buy like a whole system of stuff. So just kind of keep it in mind if you're looking at chisels that you not only need the chisels, but you need a way to sharpen them. So do you need a diamond stone? Do you need wet stones? Do you need a sharpening guide? Do you need, you know, a flat stone with sandpaper, which some people prefer that. They call that the scary sharp method using sandpapers and a flat stone um, or a flat edge like float glass that you can put the sandpaper on. Once again, it's a rabbit hole of stuff that you can dive into. I'm not diving into that rabbit hole. I'm going to finish this thing, doggone it. This has been sitting here. These little fixes I think are good. I only had two. Speaking of my chisel, I'm going to chisel inside the hole here because I can't really, I'm just getting the bulk of this off of here and then I'll use a piece of sandpaper to get inside there. I can't put my big, my big uh, sander inside there. My oscillating sander does not fit inside these little cups. So I do have a piece of sandpaper here. What is this, 220? I have a rough piece of sandpaper, small one, if I can find it, that I was using for, here we go. We're just doing some rough sanding. This is like a piece of 120, and I'm just gonna use this with my hand inside here just to take off the surface stuff off of here. I'm not gonna use it up here because I don't wanna I'll use the sanding machine, but for down in here, this is fine. And then I'll hit this with a finer grit, but I just need to get the surface. Ooh, that looks good. Uh, let me get my vacuum and clean it out. All right, I think we're in a good shape now. I've got a little piece of 220 here, and I'm just gonna hit this with some 220 just to make it look a little nicer and smoother inside. I didn't do a lot of sanding inside of these things just because it's hard to get in there, and it's gonna have cups sitting over top of it, so it doesn't really need it. But I do wanna get that flat and flush. All right, so that one's done. I've got one up here at the top, and I'm gonna hit that with my sanding disc, uh, my orbital sander here, which I already have set up, and I think this has like a 220 on here. So I'm gonna hit it with a 220, and then that should, the whole surface should be prepped for doing some finish. I've got my finish already mixed, so I'm gonna put that on real quick, and then we can just set that aside after we get that first coat of finish put in there. All right, that did not take long. It wasn't meant to take long. Um, just had to knock that, I don't even know where it was, right there. And that looks really good. I am gonna just use the vacuum to clean off the dust off the top here though. All right, and then 
I'm going to move over to uh, I'm going to move over to the table over here. Now I don't have the camera set up over here, so I'm going to I think what I will do is let's check. Do I have camera three on? Yeah, it's sort of I kind of got it in the same spot. Let me just adjust it for you, and then we can have a little bit better coverage here. Boom, there we go. Right there. And I've got a, uh, I actually need to grab a couple of paper towels. And what I'm gonna do is use one of the paper towels just to um, apply this stuff. So I'm just gonna tear the paper towel in half. I don't need the whole thing. And I'm just making a little pad here. There we go. And I'm just going to use this edge of the pad right here just to kind of wipe the stuff on there. The other thing I'm going to do, I learned this the hard way. So I'm going to put this glove on, which I used the other day, but because this finish gets tacky on your fingers and doesn't like to come off. So I've got a glove on here. I've got some finish in here that's already mixed with mineral spirits. So this is salad bowl finish. Um, this is the uh, do, 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 general finishes. So there you go. So general finishes salad bowl finish. And I've mixed it about 50-50 with some uh, mineral spirits. And the mineral spirits just helps to get all of this stuff down inside of the wood. So I'm going to soak my applicator pad here a little bit. And then actually, you know what I'm going to do? flip this puppy over and I'm going to do the bottom first just because it's easier it's nice and flat and there's less less issue getting it down inside here um, I'm just gonna run this over top this is end grain once again so end grain is thirsty thirsty wood so as I apply this stuff on here I gotta put this right in the corner here so as I apply this um, it basically put this one right in the corner too. I just need to get this in a spot where, there we go, where we're supported. Um, basically this stuff is already gone on the surface. It's just stoked right in. So I'm just going to run another. So don't be afraid of using too much on here. Just, you just really want to get the wood soaked. Um, this is the same way you would do a mineral oil finish on an end grain cutting board. It's just this is just something a little different. This will harden inside. So this has like varnishes inside that will harden and protect and seal those wood grains better than a mineral. The mineral oil kind of seals the wood up a little bit, but it, it goes away over time. Whereas this stuff, is a much more lasting finish that does not really re need to be renewed like the uh, just a plain mineral oil finish would. So, but like I said, this is a very thirsty, thirsty board because it's all in grain. So all this stuff, as, as I wipe this on, it's really super wet. And then within a few seconds, everything that I put on here is gone and the surface is almost dry. You know where it's not dry is on the little spots where there's epoxy because <laughs> epoxy won't soak anything in. But all these spots on the side where it's all in grain, um, it just soaks in. Now the funny thing is the walnut is not as thirsty as the maple. The maple just really, really sucks this stuff in. All right, I'm gonna use my other towel here to flip this over. Um, that's why I have two towels here. because. And then let me, because I don't want to get this stuff on my clean hand. There we go. And, you know, you're going to get a little bit, but I try not to. All right. Now I'm going to work on the top because this is really where I want most of the protection coming in from. Um, I just wanted to get like a seal coat on that bottom. And then we're going to put a lot more product on the top here. And 
that's all there is to it. It's really easy to do this. Um, and like I said, you can do basically the same process with uh, mineral oil. And if you're gonna use a mineral oil beeswax finish for your cutting boards, you should probably just do a straight mineral oil coat or two first, just to get it really soaked down in there because the beeswax doesn't soak in as far. So you wanna get the mineral oil coat or two done and then come back and use your mineral oil and beeswax mixture over top of that. Or I say beeswax, it's mineral oil and wax. There's a lot of different waxes people use. It's not just beeswax. It's not carnauba. All right, I'm just getting this thing soaked because this wood up on the cutout areas is much more raw and much more thirsty because it has not been sanded down as finely. So when you sand this stuff, it kind of, you're kind of crushing the fibers when, when you sand it. And that kind of closes them off a little bit. But when you uh, have not really sanded very much, thirsty. All right. The nice thing is I'm going to get this done. Then I can set this off to the side and move on to some other things. Also need to make sure that I get the sides here, not in grain, so this doesn't need a whole lot. I'm just gonna run this along the edges, make sure they get covered. I need my little pad here, so I can hold this and keep it from moving. Yeah, the side is all side grain or long grain. So it's not soaking up like the others. I mean, it will soak in a little bit, but not to the extent that the end grain does. Anyway, it looks really nice when it's all done like this. Um, the look of it is basically the same as it would look if you used mineral oil. Um, maybe a little bit more on the yellowish side. I mean, this stuff does have kind of an amber, I don't know if you can see it, but it does have a little bit of an amber hue to it. So it does impart that um, to the to the maple, which the maple, uh, do this, yeah, there we go. So the maple is about this color when it's raw, and then you can see how much that darkens up, and it kind of stays this color. It doesn't really lighten up once you're finished. This is pretty much the color it's gonna remain. So just keep that in mind if you're looking for decorative stuff, um, that the maple does, depending on your finish, will get a little bit more, a little bit more yellow in color, a little more amber. But um, I like the way it looks, and it's, I'm not really worried about the color of it so much. So you still get the really nice, um, contrast between the walnut. And the other thing is those little circles that I filled in, when I made the epoxy, I actually used some dye stain in the epoxy. Um, normally I would just use black, but what I did was I had some stuff called Mission Brown. So I put Mission Brown in there. I did about five drops of Mission Brown and then just a couple of dots of black. So I got basically a really, really, really dark brown. And that actually looks really good. I mean, they sort of stand out, but, but they blend pretty well. Um, they don't just look like a bunch of black dots. They kind of blend in much nicer because they do have that brown in them. So it looks a little bit more natural, I think. So I kind of like that. Uh, so you can just keep applying this stuff. Um, you don't have to go crazy though. Um, it's soaking in and like I said, we did the bottom. So it should be pretty well absorbed in and um, like on uh, mineral oil, I would usually put a, a lot of mineral oil. There are people who just basically fill up a, a, a plastic tub with mineral oil and then just submerge their boards in it so that they completely soak and then they pull them out and let all the excess drip out. I don't go to that extent. I usually just apply my mineral oil just like this, and it's more than sufficient. I've never had an issue with it. But I mean, for people who make a lot of boards, it's just easier to have a tub and you just dunk your boards in the tub, let them soak in, 
pull them out, let them drip dry, and then you're done. Um, so that it is a kind of an efficient way of applying your, your finish if you're doing a lot of production work. I'm gonna put my lid back on here because I'm gonna come back probably tomorrow. I will sand this down. I'll just do, give it a scuff. I've got like a, a really light um, pad and I'll give it a scuff and then I'll apply one more coat on top of that. I'm just gonna take this pad that I just made and I'm gonna put this over the edge of my trash can because I want it to dry out before I throw it away. I don't want to throw away wet stuff. All right, um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to move this over to that side of my shop where I actually have a, it's where I do most of my painting and stuff. But that way I don't have to have this in the way and it's going to kind of allow me to do some other stuff. You can see the bottom is pretty much dry. You can see there's a couple little spots with some finish on there. And the same with the top, there's some spots that have some finish, but it looks almost dry in places, right? So I could take my little painting pyramids over there and I don't need my silicone pad. I just need the uh, painting pyramid. So give me just a second here. So that's, that's knocked out. Got that taken care of is nice. All right, and that can sit there and dry and cure. And we'll come back and I will handle that tomorrow. All right, what else we got going here? I need to turn my brightness down. My battery's gonna run down to nothing. There we go. All right, I need to clean. I'm gonna keep my glove because gloves are expensive and I'm almost out of gloves, which is sad because I have to buy more. And I do not like having to buy gloves, but, and the ones I have are kind of expensive, <laughs> but they're really nice. And they, they almost never tear and rip and stuff. So they're, they're kind of, kind of thick. And I prefer the black ones over like the blue ones. I don't know why, I just do. So here's a little trick. If you want to keep your glove, Blow it up like a balloon and it'll pop off your hand. Ready? Here we go. <laughs> and then I can grab it in the back here. It's still kind of got finish on the fingers. So I don't want to touch those, but I can take my little silicone and I'll just set this on my silicone and set this off to the side somewhere. I'm not sure where. We'll set it over here for the moment and get it out of the way. All right, well, that's a lot of my little projects that I've knocked out. I finished up the little press pad thing and got some Velcro on there, cut the felt out. That's done. I've got my handle on here and that is epoxied in and it ain't moving. So that's done. I got that, um, I actually filled those with the black epoxy this morning before I came out. So I set that uh, with the, the activator. So it's been dried, we got that sanded, and we got our first coat of finish on there. That's done. Where do we go from here? Well, glad you asked. Um, I have been trying to, dying to, get this stupid table out here. Um, I've got two things I want to do. Two things that I want to do. One is I want to make another cutting board, but with an inlay, with, an, with a walnut inlay of a sewing machine. That's a little harder to do. It takes a little bit more time. I have to do some glue ups. I have to do some panel cuts. I actually have the wood down for that. So I have, uh, let me bring this over here. I've got two pieces of wood that have already been milled up um, in terms of flatness. So these are inch and a half thick, inch and, inch and a half, inch and a quarter. Um, they were inch and a half when I started, they were six quarter. These are now 1.3 inches. This one is 1.3 inches. So they're basically milled to the same 
thickness, which is good if you're going to make uh, boards like I just finished over there. But I'm thinking what I want to do is I want to do something with a, an inlay. So I want a, a maple board. So I actually have three of these cutoffs right here. One, two, there's another one around here somewhere. Um, here it is. These are leftovers. So these are leftovers from when I was making those boards, the ones I just finished. Um, I've got this other piece of maple right here that I could do some more of those boards. And I can make one ingrain cutting board out of maple, just maple. In the middle of it, I want to carve out a, um, a silhouette of a sewing machine. I haven't really found the right silhouette yet. I may just take a picture of a sewing machine myself and make one. But I would like to make a, a silhouette of a sewing machine to, to make a, um, an inlay. And because I want this to be, still be a cutting board, I don't want it to be just a, um, a showpiece. I would like it to be a cutting board. I would need to make the inlay also out of ingrain because if you if you fill it with like a lot of times I do these things and I fill them I do the carving and then I'll fill it with epoxy I'll just use black epoxy and I keep saying this I did one for my son I did a, uh, a Jack Daniels um, inlay for him on a cutting board that looked beautiful um, and but it's not really usable as a cutting board. And I did one of uh, a tabletop for a buddy of mine. It was a countertop. And I did one for him. It also was beautiful, but um, it's a countertop, so you're, he's not going to be cutting on it, right? So that also was another thing. So here's, let's see if I can show you. Let me get up here and I'll show you. This is the one I did. Oh, there we go. I'm trying to show, I don't have it on my computer, but anyway, you can see that that's the one I did for my son with the, uh, the Jack Daniels inlay. So I had done, let's see if I can see the whole, the whole thing here. So there's another shot of it. There's another shot. Now I'm just trying to, so there you go. There's like a close up, and that's all epoxy inlay. So that was kind of really cool. There's, there's the carve out before I poured the epoxy in there. I wish I had these on the computer so I could show you a little bit better, but you can see there's another picture of the, um, the carving. And um, anyway, so I did that and that turned out really nice, um, but it's not really suitable for using as a, um, as a cutting board because it, the epoxy would get messed up. And every time you drag a knife over it, you're gonna scratch that epoxy and it's just gonna look not great. Um, I was looking for the tabletop I did for a buddy of mine, which was really beautiful as well, but I can't seem to find that. Um, and I did an entire countertop and I had that thing on my CNC machine. It was a bear, but it, it turned out really cool. And, but I have not done a, an, a proper inlay with a, um, let me see. I can't find the countertop. Oh, well, um, I have not done a proper, um, inlay with ingrain going into ingrain so that you could use it as a cutting board if you wanted to. Now, hopefully they wouldn't, but my thought is if I can get a really good one and if I can get that fit, right, it's getting that exact fit that, and I would do test carves too. Um, if I couldn't get the, so what would happen is if I couldn't get the, the walnut piece to really go and fit perfectly, I would just fill it with black epoxy and be done with it. I'm hoping I can do one like that, but I need to make an ingrain piece. It doesn't have to be as large as the cutting board, um, but it does need to fit, um, and it doesn't need to be as thick either. Like I could cut these to, instead of inch and a quarter, which is what I cut the thickness of those, I could cut it to the final pieces to like, I don't know, three quarters of an inch or an inch. Um, do the carving down in there and then separate the carving out on the bandsaw so that it would fall out um, the piece that would go inside. So anyway, I, I, I really want to do that, um, which would mean that I would need to make 
some cutting boards, again, <laughs> which is cutting boards, more gluing, more stuff. So I don't know, what do you think? Should I do some cutting boards and do that? And do, I mean, I, I know I've got my cherry thing over there, um, but I mean, I could probably make this thing and put it in my shop for a couple of hundred bucks easily. Um, I mean, easily a couple of hundred dollars for a cutting board, which would more than pay for all the wood that I've used here. Um, and because all these other cutting boards are not for sale, so I'm not really making any money off of them. So I need to make something that's going to make some money that offsets the money I spent on all of this. Because I also have a big piece of three quarter that I bought for doing the legs for my cherry table, which I need to offset the cost of that. Because if I don't sell the cherry table, it's mine. And then I spent a lot of money on a cherry table, which, you know, <laughs> oops. So I need to make a little money. And this is an easy way to make money. So what I need to do is figure out how big this is gonna be. Um, I need some more strips. These are not quite the exact same size. So I don't know if you can see, some of them are a little taller. I would basically get these down to the same height and then I can glue them like, I don't know which way I wanna glue them. I can glue them with ways like this, right? And then, um, I can make some small ones, so I can make some thinner ones that go in there. I think, which, which, what's the thickness? These are all the same thickness, and I think these are the same thickness as this. They are. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut some strips that are thinner, because I'm gonna get some pattern in here. I don't want just a regular rectangular pattern on here. I want to get these the same width, but then I want some thinner ones, and then we will make the thing out of that. This is 15 inches, I think what these are. So these are 15 inches. So I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and mill up the boards for the, for the walnut one first. I've got these, I think maybe a couple of more, a couple of more wide ones, and then a couple of thin ones just to, well, if I do some thin ones, yeah, I need, I need like three thin ones and another wide one I think would give me the width that I want for this. So I'm going to take this board and I'm going to take it over to my, um, my crosscut sled. No, I'm not going to take my crosscut sled. I'm going to take it to my crosscut table over here. Crosscut table? No. Can I say this correctly? Probably not. My compound miter table saw. It's not a table saw. Compound miter saw. I'm going to learn how to talk, maybe, one day. Um, now, the other thing I've got on this board is there's a little bit of edge grain right here and here, so I would lose a little bit of this board right here, which I think that's okay. I'm going to lose that off of here because I've got some specific stuff I want to cut. Um, let me see if this is square on the end. Grab my woodpecker square and see if this is cut square. Um, yeah, that's pretty square on the end there. So, what I'm going to do is I've got my, this is my flat edge right here, my flat side. So I'm gonna cut off 15 inches off of this thing. I know I'm doing this down on my chair right here. You really can't see, can you? It's not really fair, is it? Like here, let me tune in to watch you do stuff on a chair that I can't see what you're doing. Nice, all right, I'll put it up here. I'm gonna mark 15 inches off on here which like I said is basically what those other ones are. Uh, grab a pencil, we're gonna mark 15. All right, here. And are they all 15 or are they a little longer than 15? I think I went longer than 15 by like an eighth of an inch or so. Let me see. Nope, they're 15 still. All right, well, we'll go 15. 15 inches. Okay. And I'm just gonna Carry that line over here. Strike it from the other side just to get it all the way across. All right, we've got a line here, 15 inches. I'm gonna cut it here so I know which side to cut on. And once I get that cut, we'll come over to the table saw. I need to raise my camera up a little bit, don't I? You always kind of just get my chin. You just get my chin. I need to. I can go wider. 
Let's go wider, maybe. There we go. A little wider. Wider. There we go. I think that might work if I just go wider. Does that work? That works. Well, no, not really. You still get my chin. Okay. I know this is really stupid, right? I should really work these things out beforehand, and I don't. But you know what? That's just the way I roll. And that's crooked, right? So let's make it not crooked, not crooked, not crooked. And still kind of crooked, not crooked. It's as not crooked as it's going to get. All right, you can still see my uh, board there. Hopefully you can see my big giant. This is what's the problem is when you're six five. There we go, a little bit of FaceTime. When you're six five, you know, just things happen. All right, I need to cut this up here. Let's see if that's going to be in the way. A little bit, a little bit. There we go. All right. And I'm going to get this. Sorry, I don't have a camera like directly on here, but you get the idea. All right. Right there. I'm going to just secure this piece down so that when I make the cut, this piece doesn't fall and do damage to anything. I do need to get my power cable and plug it in and get my headphones and then we can do that. I'm going to unlock my saw. So the nice thing about this saw, if you can see this, can you see this over here? Barely. But anyway, this saw is articulating. It kind of has this really cool robot arm thing instead of the long poles. So I love this saw. But let's go ahead and make a cut. This will just take a minute, less than a minute, like a couple of seconds. Oh my goodness. So I was stupid and forgot I had my heater on and I just popped my fuse. There we go. It happens. Okay, let's try this again. I can't run the heater and the saw and the vacuum at the same time. Okay. Yeah, I, I do that sometimes. I forgot I had my little heater on over here and it just, it just takes the breaker just to the, it's like, nope, can't do it. <laughs> Luckily it just pops the breaker on my power panel over there and not in my fuse box downstairs. So I would have to run downstairs and take care of that. So luckily that's not the case. All right, well, we've got this done. Now we can actually come over, like I said, we can come over to the, uh, to the table saw. And we're gonna need a table saw view for that. Let me get my, uh, let me lock this down and get my dust collection because we're gonna need that for the table saw as well. Because we're gonna make a few cuts over here at the table saw to get the pieces we need. I have no idea how much I'm gonna cut. I'm kind of making this up as I go, but we will find out. Um, hang on a second. Am I connected? I am connected, okay. All right. So let me get you a camera view that you can live with here. I'm gonna go to this camera and we're just gonna slide over here to the table saw like that. Probably fine. Does that look good? Yep, that looks fine. Good enough for what we're doing. So the first thing I'm gonna do is adjust this blade height because it's set really high for something else I was cutting. That's probably big enough. Um, I think what I'm going to do is trim off this little edge right here, this little live edge. So I'm going to trim that off first. And I just want to have the, uh, the wood that we're going to work with here. 
So I'm just going to come over here and adjust this until it just is going to take off that edge. That's probably right there. All right. So that's our first cut. Um, do I have this plugged in? Not yet. Let me plug in my saw, which means I have to unplug my lathe. Ugh. I share plugs. We share in this shop. It's a share and share like shop. All right. Let's make this first cut right here. Let me just uh, get this set up. So I can use this. Perfect. All right. First cut. And that's nice and clean. I think we got a good edge off of that with no live edge left, so we're good. Um, that was actually a really clean cut for maple. No burns. All right, let me look at these boards and see how wide these are. And see if they are the same width. Some of them are a couple slightly different height, but I don't care about that. I care about the width right now because these are basically the same height as this one. They're off a little bit from each other, but they're pretty darn close. I mean, these are a little taller, but for the most part, they're all about the same. Um, and I'm gonna run these through the uh, planer at some point in time. These will get run through the planer. Oh, that's why these are a little smaller. I ran these through the planer already, so that'll work. Um, so what I'm gonna do is uh, see how wide these are. These are two and an eighth. These are like two and an eighth inches. So I'm gonna set my fence over here so I can cut one of these at two and an eighth. But I can't just set my fence at two and an eighth. I'm just gonna cut it from the end here, which means I need to figure out two and an eighth inches on here. And then we can uh, make a mark. Now, what do I do with my pencil? Pencil, pencil, pencil. There you go. I've got my, I'm looking for my square, there it is. Okay, let me make a uh, two and an eighth mark on here. And then we can figure out where that needs to, actually I need to do it on the end. It needs to be on the end. Okay, and then I'll just strike a line this and it just allows me to line up my saw blade that and that should be that should be pretty much perfect right there Actually, kind of using the this other board, so I can feel when it's kind of flush between the two, right there. So if I make a cut right here, yep, that should give me the boards that are it's the exact same as this. And then I'm gonna cut some thin ones that go in between there. Like I said, I'm just trying to make a pattern here and Part of that pattern is some thicker, wider boards and then some thinner ones to go between them. Look, if you saw me move my, my uh, gripper over, it's because I wanted to be able to push 
and have force pushing both of these through at the same time. If I just have it over here, what happens is once you separate these fibers right here, this will keep going forward, but this one stops and it gets a little nub on the edge. So if you have the gripper on both sides, it pushes them through equally and it gives you a clean cut all the way through the board on this side as well. So there you go, little, little, little something for you. All right, so there are our wide boards. I think four of them is fine. I need three boards to go between them. Um, I think, what do you think? About like that? That looks good, right? That looks pretty good. So how wide is that? I don't know. Let's see, is that, it's about an inch. What do you think, an inch? Or an inch and an eighth. One and one eighth inches. And I think what I can do here is now I'll set one and an eighth inches on here. And then I will just run these through like this. And like I said, this is just kind of my own little recipe here for the design in my head. Just gonna move this center block over so it doesn't hit the saw and will support my wood coming over and across like that. All right, let's cut one at one and an eighth inch. And well, actually we're gonna cut three, but then I can just keep moving it over and make repetitive cuts with the same measurement instead of having to measure an inch and an eighth from the end of the block each time. So there we go. All right. All right. So, oops, sorry. Um, so basically, turn it like this. What I'm after is this little pattern because even though these are going to be um, the same color and species of wood, by alternating the uh, the size. And then I can also make sure that my grain is alternating. So I'm going to flip this one, my grain direction, and then flip this one, this, and I think, and I need to flip this one, this, there we go. All right. That is going to give me an interesting pattern within the grain, within the end grain itself, once I cut this up. Um, so if you recall, when making end grain cutting boards, you actually have to glue up the long grain first, just like we did. So you just cut the boards and glue them together. Kind of seems weird that you would cut the board up and glue it back together. But what you're doing is you're getting blocks of wood. You want to get little blocks of wood. <clears throat> And those little blocks of wood are going to give you interesting patterns. I need to get one edge kind of flat here. Right. Oh, this is not square, that's why. Like, why are these, but oh, all these edges were square. There we go. Okay. So like this. It's gonna be how it is. So I'm gonna go ahead and glue these up. 
there's no sense not gluing it now. And let's see here. Getting all my tools out of the way here because I'm going to bring some clamps over to do this. Um, cutting boards are really fun. You can be really creative with them. Um, you know, there's no rules for cutting boards per se. Um, you can be very creative and mix and match your patterns. There's 3D patterns you can make and, and there's a bunch of different things you can do with cutting boards. So they're, they're kind of fun. Um, I'm trying to do this particular thing. It's going to be a thick board, but not super thick. When I get these done, I'll make it about an inch and a quarter thick, which I think is about a pretty good thickness. Um, an inch and a quarter thick is about the same thickness as this board right here. Maybe this is just a little bit bigger than that, but it's a good thickness for a cutting board. It has, it has heft, it has mass to it, but it's not so big that it's just a big giant chunk of wood. Um, all right, we're going to need this, all right? Definitely going to need that. I'm going to need a couple of clamps like this. And actually I can use, because I'm only doing one of these things, I actually, let me get three of these. There we go. And then also, well, I'm not going to worry about it because I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to put these through the planer when I'm done. So that is a good place to start. Um, the one thing I am going to do is I'm going to tape two of these up so that um, I don't screw up the, uh, I don't want to screw up the mechanisms here for the stuff. Where's my blue tape? There it is. Oop, come here. <clears throat> so if you want to keep your clamps looking nice for a long time, be sure to put glue on them before you use them for clamping up stuff because when the glue squeezes out and gets in the little teeth, it makes it really hard for your clamps to work. So I'm going to put some glue on here. Um, you know, I should probably change an angle. Let me change my camera angle again for you so it makes it a little bit easier for you to see what I'm doing over here. So I'm just going to rotate you just a little bit over here. Bring this up just a hair like that. There you go. And let me get back over here and I'll switch that camera angle for you. There you go. That's better. All right. So I'm just putting, measuring out how much tape I need to put on here. And I mean, I, I don't need to clamp beyond this because the clamp's going to get here. So I just need a glue or a piece of tape that runs between here because in between each of these boards, I'll get squeeze out and that squeeze out would land on here. So if I have a piece of tape running on top of there, it is going to give me a much better glue up. All right. The other thing I'm going to do is move my, uh, <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm going to move my fence back here because it just gives me a backstop for me to put my clamps against, kind of keep things square. So on this one, it's going to go up here, like that. But you can see I can just put it against there. It gives me a nice backstop. I'm going to put this up here for a moment, bring this one in, like that. Then I can put them up on top. So I'm going to use this board just to kind of square things up here. I do want them to be at least square on one side would be nice. <laughs> okay, just like that. So when I get ready to put these all and clamp them down really hard, I will do that. So what I need to do now is flip these up. Because the glue is going to get it put onto these sides and then flip them over and glue them together. And I need my little glue thing here, but it is already covered in glue. So I'm going to peel the glue off of here. Oh, silicone brushes are nice, but 
you gotta clean all the glue off of it. Usually, if you use a lot of glue, you can get most of this to come off in one big chunk. And then the bristles will break free of that. Uh, but sometimes you just lose bristles. As it gets older, some of the bristles tear away and sadness. There we go. So there's a big chunk of glue out of here, and this is pretty much ready to grow. But I have lost some bristles, so I need to just buy a new one of these at some point in time. I mean, they're pretty cheap. I think it's like 10 bucks, and they last quite a while. But over time, um, if you do this method of cleaning them, where you're just basically ripping the, the hardened glue out from them, um, it will start to tear out the bristles. Facts. <laughs> it's just what happens. All right. So now, get my glue. I'm just using Typong 2. That's what I always use for this stuff. Some people are like, oh, you got to use Typong 3 because it's watertight and everything. I'm like, well, first of all, um, who's Who's getting water inside of their cutting boards like that? I mean, if you clean them, you're cleaning the surface. You're not cleaning down inside because if your water, if your, if your board is finished properly, you have a water vapor barrier, which is called your, your mineral oil finish or whatever, your wax. Um, but also the amount of water that gets in there is not going to destroy your glue joint. That is not, at least in my experience, that is not your biggest concern. Your biggest concern is stupid people who don't know how to treat their cutting boards. But you know, at that point, it's theirs and I don't care. Um, like my son's roommates in college who took his really nice cutting board that I made him and they put it in the dishwasher because, you know, it's dirty. We should wash it. You know, I just cleaned that br brush off and now I'm using my finger, so I'm not very smart, am I? Anyway, yeah, his, his roommates took his cutting board and put it in the dishwasher. So I can tell you that uh, they are not dishwasher safe. And it cracked that sucker on so many of the, of the seams. Um, it just totally destroyed it, which was sad because it was really nice. It was a really beautiful board that I made him too. But, you know, college kids, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? So I made him a big one. That's when I made him the, the Jack Daniels one. Um, but I also made him a companion one to go with the Jack Daniels one that actually has uh, no inlay and is just an end grain. And then you can use that for actually cutting stuff. And the Jack Daniels one's more of a, it's a party thing. It's like, oh, look at this really cool thing. You can put drinks on it and other such things. And it can be more like a serving tray. It's really big like a serving tray. All right, I'm trying to get this one edge lined up here. And then I will continue this. The only thing I will tell you about gluing up your joints on boards like this is just to make sure first that they're very flat, straight cuts. And then the other thing is just use a lot of glue. I mean, not a lot of glue, just make sure you have good glue surface coverage. So you want glue on the entire, like I wouldn't just stick this on here like this because there would be places where the glue would not contact. Um, so I make sure that this glue is spread evenly across the entire surface so that when I actually go and apply pressure, I've got glue touching all of the board surfaces and that is what keeps out bacteria and stuff like that from getting down in your board. That, that's the end, keeping your board from failing. You don't want like little voids in your board. That just never looks good. All right, two more to go. Then we'll put some clamping pressure on here. So what do we do? We've kind of done a lot of little things today. That's why I named this the smorgasbord, which is not as easy to say. Smorgasbord. Um, but it basically just a little bit of everything going on right now. Um, like I said, this I've kind of had in my head. So it'll take a little while before it's ready. I can do test cuts though. I can get some wood and do test cuts for like the, the inlay part and stuff, 
which I will absolutely do a test cut of the inlay part that is going to be the, um, oh, I don't know what that is, um, the, the walnut that's going to be inlaid into here. I will definitely test cut that for fit before I go do the final walnut cut because I do not want to ruin that. Um, if it's not going to work, it's not going to work. I mean, you know, I hope it does. My, my uh, CNC is pretty accurate, but um, last time I did an inlay thing, it didn't work out as well as I wanted it to. Um, and sometimes the secret is to not, you just don't, your inlay doesn't need to be thick. I don't need to do like a two inch inlay in here. The inlay portion only needs to be like maybe, maybe a quarter of an inch thick at most. It doesn't need to be very deep because that wood is not going to be worn away over time. All right. So I have these set here. I'm going to so bring these together. I'm going to try to keep these straight over here best I can. Just to give me a nice flat edge. Because when I go to cut these things off, I want at least one edge that's kind of pretty flat here. All right, that appears to be pretty good. I'm going to just put some pressure on top here and then get some pressure on this clamp and then some pressure on this one. Just really gentle for the moment because you will get shifting. So just kind of doing them at the same time. Keep that shifting to a minimum. See, there's a little shifting right there. I'm going to loosen these and see if I can shift this back right there. There we go. And this one. good this one moved it's hard because you know unless you're getting exact even pressure as you go here I wanna, I wanna, there we go there we go oh god it shifted again there's a couple of them that just really want to shift on me here now the other thing you can do is just not tighten them up right away just kind of get them together and let the glue set up just a little bit. Um, get this. There we go. That's better. Okay. There we go. All right. Now I get it clamped. And now I'm going to use this one. Um, I need to put some tape on here. And I think what I'm going to do is tape this along the side. So I think I'm going to tape this along here. Um, and then do this sideways, maybe. But the tape does make a huge difference. I will, I will tell you that. Um, let's see. I need tape from here to about here. I'm going to need two pieces of tape on here. And you don't want your tape to get wrinkled because then it doesn't sit flat. Your clamp won't sit flat. So make sure your tape is nice and flat. All right. Get this one. All righty. And then I'm going to try to put this on the side like this and get that will get me clamping pressure across a much wider area. This. There we go. Lots of clamping pressure now. Ah, just like that. All right. And looking for squeeze out. I should see squeeze out on all the boards in at least. Now, if I turn over, I'm probably going to get more on the bottom. There we go. So I've got squeeze out coming through all these boards here. It looks pretty good. Uh, one thing I'll do is let these sit for, I don't know, like an hour, maybe half an hour, between half an hour and an hour, and then come back with a scraper and just scrape off this squeeze out off of here. That way when I'm done and take them out of clamps, I've got less cleanup work to do. 
but this is pretty good. I, I mean, it's, yeah, not bad, not bad. Okay, so I can set this to the side and let that curate for a while. Now, um, I've got this maple, or not the maple, I've got the maple done, but I've got the, uh, the walnut that I need to figure out exactly what I wanna do for the walnut here. Stop doing that, what are you doing? Oh, good grief. Um, so I'm gonna figure out what I'm gonna do here, and uh, let's see. I wanna make one, but I don't, it doesn't need to be as big, it doesn't need to be as thick, but I need to figure out how much of this I'm gonna turn into one. Um, I had extra strips on that one, so that was easy to figure out because I already had three strips that were already milled up from another board. I'm probably gonna to have to use two boards on here. They don't need to be as big. So I could probably do like 10 inches. You get a couple of 10 inch boards on here. I also have voids on here. So this has some, this has some, some voids and stuff. I wanna work around those. I do not want to use, there's a big knot right here. So I would, I'm gonna cut around and not use some of this wood because it won't be very pretty in the end. Like this is a big void but I'll cut strips out of here and avoid that area. So let me see how big this piece is right here. I think what I'm gonna do is a 10 inch instead of 15 inches, which is what that one is. I'm gonna do a 10 inch. And yeah, okay. So let's, uh, I'm making this up as I go. But we're gonna do the same kind of thing where we're gonna do some alternating type stuff. I, I don't know that I will use the same size, it doesn't really matter because this is gonna be inlay. But I do need to trim this up before I make a measurement here. So let me, uh, let me trim this off because this is not square on the end there. So I'm gonna take this over to the miter. I also have this nice big piece of walnut or uh, maple left over here, which is pretty nice. That is a really nice thing of walnut. Um, so I'm not sure what I'm going to use this for, but it's really, really nice wood. So at some point in time, I will put that to use. Let's see, that's hooked up. I need my dust collection. There we go. And I'm just checking. All right. I just want to make sure I wasn't, I've got my stuff on here. I should hear um, if anybody is doing anything, I should actually hear it, but I just want to make sure. Let me hear something here. Yep, I just want to make sure I'm not going to miss anybody's comments. If uh, anybody makes a comment, I should hear them in my headphones. But uh, if anybody wants to make a comment, I should be able to hear you. Oh, well, there you go. See, that worked. I could hear you, which is awesome. All right, let me uh, switch back. And there we go. Cool. Where did my window go? Ah, there it is. Well, welcome and thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see. I'm going to hook this up and I think my heater's turned off this time so I won't blow my little fuse there again. And let me get this squared up and see if I have an edge that was actually marked as being square when I milled this originally. I usually do that. I think it's this edge. There we go. It's this edge right here and this edge right here. So I'm just going to cut this nasty crooked edge off of here and turn my table a little bit here so I have some more room. Kind of get lined up. There we go. I just need a square edge to work from before I make any measurements on here. Okay. Yeah, thank you for following. I do appreciate that. That is very nice of you. And hopefully you will come back 
And hopefully I won't bore you to tears. I try to do cool stuff. And usually I make sewing machine bases in here, which, you know, is my thing. But I'm not doing that today. I'm doing some different stuff. That was not good. So what that was, uh, that was my, uh, that was my fuse. And you can see it's dark in here. Thankfully, the computer is on a different circuit. So I'm going to run and grab that breaker real quick. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. That's really weird. It doesn't normally do that. That's the first time it's done that. Okay. And in the basement. This is why I need to get an electrician to come over here and give me some love on my outlets here. I need a breakout box in my garage that I can add a whole bunch of more circuits in here. <sighs> so if anybody knows an electrician who's good and doesn't charge an arm and a leg in the Northern Virginia area, that'd be awesome. Okay, well, here we are once again. Power, lights. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna turn the vacuum on for a second here because that was really weird. I have no idea why it just did that. Because normally I run the vacuum and the saw and I don't tax things too much. But here's the thing. Every light in my garage, one, two, three, four, five, five lights, my vacuum and my saw, they're all working on the same circuit. So every now and then it just goes, nope, I give up, which is sad. Uh, let me clean up, uh, oh, here it is. Let me clean up all this sawdust I just made here. All right, I'm just gonna get my uh, square and my pencil and my maybe my tape measure and uh, I'm just gonna mark off 10 inches on here. Maybe cut a couple of 10 inch strips and then just do that all at once here. And that'll make my life a little easier. I won't have to keep coming back to the saw. I'm gonna need at least two of them anyway. Let's move this down. All right. But yeah, I've got this big void in the wood here, so I really have to work around that. Um, so the thing about these boards right here is this is what they call um, rustic walnut. I think it's prettier than regular walnut in, in some circumstances because it has, it has a lot of flowy grain in there. Uh, but the reason for that is that it usually has knots and voids and things like that. But if you're like me and you work in smaller, I don't know if that's nice. I'm going to do 12 inches. I don't like the 10. 10 looks too short. I'm going to do 12. Um, I work in smaller boards, like usually thinner boards. Like uh, I'm usually working with boards that are three inches wide um, for most of the projects that I, I make. Uh, so for me, it's easy to work around voids in the wood and knots and stuff and mill out three inch wide boards and you get this beautiful wood grain and it's like half the cost of, it's less than half the cost of clear walnut boards. So clear walnut and not super wide widths, but regular width, I'd say up to like 10 inches wide, usually runs about 11, dollars a board foot 1150 somewhere in that neighborhood um, depending on who your hardwood dealer is so you could be paying a lot more than that that's that's based on my hardwood dealer ah there's leaves blowing up my face but um this stuff because it's rustic is only um four fifty five dollars a board foot so much more economical all right i'm going to try this one more time See if I blow a circuit here.
All right, success. I think if I turn the vacuum on first and then do the saw, if I have the saw on and then I try to hit the vacuum, I think that just too much fork. So anyway, you can see there's a big crack void right here. I'm gonna to try to avoid that. I'll cut a strip out of here and then cut another, cut the rest of my strips out of this section. And the rest of it's all nice and clear <clears throat> and pretty. So that's kind of what we're gonna do there. I'm gonna mark another section here for 10 or for 12 inches and gives us more, more boards to work with when we're laying this out. So let me uh, loosen my little clamp and we'll slide this over. Now this has a lot more um, stuff. There's a couple of knots and things like that over here that we would have to work around. So I don't know how much I'm gonna be yielding out of this section of the board, but we'll just keep going to find out. All right, let me get this lined up. And these are quick cuts. I'm not being super exact with these. All right, so let me let me look and see what I've got here in terms of board layout because I don't want to Cut another big section off there if I don't have to. Um, and I'm looking at little cracks and like there's a pith right here, which if you know, the pith is the center of the board. And so I've got a radial crack coming out of there. So I really don't want to go more than about that much. Uh, da, 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 da. This is the part that has, there's a, you can see there's a big, um, not right here where there was a branch or something coming out. There's another one right here, but there's a little branch right here, a little crack right here with a pith. Uh, so I probably will need another piece besides this one. This one's pretty easy because it just has one crack right here. That's where the pith was and I can work, I can work around that and that's great. And then this is all quarter sawn wood. This is all like straight vertical grain. So nice to use, but uh, I might need one more piece here just to make this work. And I'm trying to figure out, because I'm trying to get some wider pieces and some smaller ones. So I'll tell you what, I'm gonna come over to the table saw and I know on this next board, I'll have no problem. If I need to make another board cut, I've got no problem because it's nice and clear all the way through. So I can get whatever I want out of the next one. I just wanna use as much of these as I can and get some similar uh, off cuts out of them or, you know, pieces. All right. So we're gonna come over here. Who's the table saw? Oh, hang on. Got my link there. Let me uh, swing the camera around because I was looking at something else. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna measure these out and see what I can get out of these boards here. I've already got nice, clean, sharp, 90 degree edges here. I think the first thing I'm gonna do is work around this crack. And you can see it's a pretty good crack and it goes right through to the pith right here. Um, so I'm gonna work around that and that is gonna be, let me get my, uh, let me get my square, my pencil here and stuff so I can measure these things. So I think what I want to do here is put a mark right here. Okay. I don't know how wide that is either. That looks like about an inch and a quarter, maybe, maybe inch and three eighths. Inch and three eighths. That's a pretty good guess. So I'm going to cut this at an inch and three eighths. I'll just set my saw up here for an inch and three eighths. That'll get me close. Okay, now, but inch and three eighths, I need to get you a little bit more lined up here. Let's see here. That looks good. And if we're good there. All right, I don't think my, 
I don't think my support blocks are going to hit, but I'm going to move them over just a little bit more just to be sure. There we go. So that runs right through. All right, I'm going to make a cut here. And then uh, we can see if we can salvage some other inch and three eighths ones out of there. And then I might do thinner ones out of this because there's more stuff to work around. I might do thinner strips out of this one. That might be the, the play here. All right, let me, uh, oh, uh, my remote is over on the CNC. Not very handy. All right, so that's a nice, ple nice clean piece of wood all the way around. That's nice and clean, and that's what I want. Um, I'm gonna work around this piece right here. So I might actually take the same measurement off of this side, inch and three eighths off of this side. I can get a couple of them off of here, so let me do that. Just work through this board. All right, now I just want to see, I think I can get one more, but I want to make sure I'm not going to be getting any of this cracked wood. You can see right in here where it just was all cracking on the edge there, but all of these are nice and clean and uh, they look good. But I think I can get one more out of here and I don't think that's going to hit anything that is going to mess us up. So let me get, uh, my side drop down here. This gives a little bit more support to the, the gripper. If you have these things lowered down to the table, it doesn't allow it to tip over. If these are lifted up, you can get some tipping. So I just like to lower these down whenever I have, whenever it's kind of hanging off the wood. All right, let's get one more here. Here is some resistance coming through there. Oh, I burned the crap out of that. Ooh, I don't really care because it's going to get glued, but that's some heavy burning on the saw side, which are on the fence side, which is really unusual. But it's nice and flat. All right, so here's my straight boards. Yeah, you do need a gripper. <laughs> you said you needed a gripper, and yes, you do need a gripper. Um, I have three of them. Uh, with different setups on them. This is my basic one, and I use this one 95% of the time. Um, there are times when I need to be offset from the fence, and I've got bigger boards or things like that. And I have, uh, I think it's called the Advanced Gripper, um, which looks, it has a lot more attachments on it. So I'll show it to you, though, because it's really quick for me to do. I'm not, I'm not sponsored by Microjig, but doggone, they make a really nice thing. So this is the advanced gripper. So you can see it has a much wider plate right here. It has a little hook on the backside. So you could actually, like if I was gonna mill this whole board right here, I could actually push this little board into the edge. So when I push forward, it actually hooks this board and pulls the board through from the backside. So it's got that, it has a little thing here that this will actually push your boards from the back. Um, it has a spacer on the side here so I can push it away from the fence a little bit more because sometimes getting the spacing right is a little weird. But anyway, these are fantastic. They're not cheap. Um, I think the regular gripper, like the one I use most of the time, I think that one's like uh, 50 bucks or something like that. The advanced ones, maybe 70 bucks. Don't quote me. You can find them different places. But I will tell you what, I use that more than any push stick or anything else because it's just, to me, it's just the safest way to use my table saw, and I am a huge fan. All right, I have these three, is that right? No, got them. I have these four pieces. 
<laughs> you know, it's funny. I was making my Christmas list. My son, bless his heart, he's a, he's, a, he's a good kid. And he's like, hey, do you still have a public uh, wish list on Amazon? He says, I, I, I'm not connected to your account anymore. I said, why, yes, I do, son. Because I actually keep, I keep several. I keep some for like my guitar stuff that I have. I keep them for woodworking tools and stuff that I'm, you know, just thinking of getting but haven't gotten yet or whatever. So I, and I've got it from things from like 10 bucks all the way up to like $3,000 on my wish list. So there's lots of variety for them. But uh, yeah, I do, I, do, uh, I do keep a wish list for sure. Okay, these were, how wide were these? I forgot. Inch and a third, two, three, three, three inch and three, three, eight, three eighths. One and three eighths. I want some thinner ones. So maybe just some one inch wide boards. So I'm gonna set a one inch fence and then we're gonna see if we can, how many one inch boards we can get out of here. I need at least three to get this kind of separated out here. So at least three of these things. And that might give me as much as I need for this inlay. So let's see, how did I do here? One inch, I'm off. There we go. Yeah, like I don't think he's gonna be getting me a, a saw stop anytime soon. I don't think that's gonna show up on my under my tree. Or my, uh, my laser engraver, I don't think that's showing up under my tree. But you know, put it out there, you never know. Maybe he secretly won the lotto and just doesn't want to tell me. And then there's my other son who's oblivious. He probably doesn't even know it's Christmas coming up because he's just oblivious. Early, okay. Okay, so yeah, I've got, so I've got a thing right here that I'm gonna need to work around. Um, that might be, I might cut this out. That might be one inch. Yeah, so I'm gonna make another one inch pass here. God, I've got knots here. This board is not gonna yield much for me, I can tell. There, there. Ah! All right. Damn. Okay. This board is getting really frustrating because I haven't cleared anything out of here that I can use. Uh, I think I've cleared one board. Oops, there goes my little. Uh, I've cleared one board out of here that's actually usable, and that's this one right here. Um, so, not pith hole right there, not pith hole right here. And then I didn't even see this one. I'm like, oh, well, I can get something out of here. Nope, right there, hole right here. As I cut this, it opened up. There's a hole right there. I don't, I don't think I can get anything out of this. Maybe if I trim this, I'm gonna trim this down by like an eighth of an inch and see if that disappears. If I can get one more out of this. I hate to just chop the whole board down and not get anything out of it, but I mean, I do need clear boards. All right, so here's, you can see this on the gripper right here. It's gonna actually in, hit the fence or hit the saw. So basically all I have to do is slide this over and then it'll leave a little tunnel right there. 
And then I'll put the fence or put the drop down here, the foot, because see how it's tippy? So I drop this down, lock it in, and now it's super stable and I can push right through. So yeah, grippers, get, get yourself, put it on your list. It's worth it. A <laughs> hundred items on your Amazon list. That is awesome. Although it could be a little hard for anybody shopping for you. Oh my God, how deep is this stupid hole? All right, let's come over a little bit more. You might have decision paralysis for folks. Uh, um, man. All right, I'm not gonna, I keep trying to get through, but I think this one just runs too deep. I keep trying to say, oh, maybe just a little bit more and I'll have some clear wood, but not going to do it. I'm going to toss these in the use for something else bin later. I mean, I'll, I'll use those scraps later. They're not garbage um, because, I mean, there's a, I mean, I can make out of this section right here, this whole part right here is clear. There's nothing in this whole part right here. So I could use this for handles for drawers or um, making pen blanks out of it or something. So I'll use this wood. I just can't use it for this purpose. But I do have a nice clear section back here and I can use that. So I'm gonna come over here and cut one more piece off of this thing. I didn't wanna to have to do it, but I'm going to. I need to get all of my tools and I'm gonna come back over here, move the dust, mark another 12 inch board and I mean, this board right here is super clear, except for this end piece right here. There's a little bit of a knot thing right here, but the rest of this board is super clear. A little teeny thing right here I can work around. <clears throat> Not a big deal. Not a big deal. So I'm gonna mark 12 inches on here. Um, I can also resaw this wood because it is super thick. I can resaw it into thinner boards. Once I get a new resaw blade, I need a new resaw blade. I think that's on my list too. Um, all right. All right, I've got my 12 inch mark on there. Let me go ahead and, I don't really need this now. That lined up. All right, let me cut this one and we'll go back to the second one. You know, that's funny about like the gift lists and stuff because like somebody like my wife and so many people, it's like, my parents or whatever, it's like, oh, what would you like? What can I get you? What do you know? What are you wanting? And they got nothing. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. And I'm like, you know, come on. And then, and then people who tell me, oh, I didn't know. I just didn't know what to get you. I'm like, well, you didn't try very hard because like you, I don't have problems dropping hints. Like I purposely make a list so that people don't have to struggle over things that I want. Now, I wish other people would do that because it would make life a lot easier for me. But yeah, I always make a list. I'm like, hey, yes, I want one of these and one of these. All right, I'm going to use this piece that I cut to fix my fence size again. This should be, should be the same size now. I'm going to set this back up. And then we can cut some one inches out of here and then we'll be good to go. That should be easy. Although, do I need to? Yeah, I need to move this back over. That's the only thing is if you forget to adjust your 
your gripper pads like I've done. You, you end up taking little slices out of them and making them thinner and such. Um, it happens. All right. You know what helps is moving your dust collection over to the actual saw that you're using. But at least, hey, my miter sled dust collection chute is now nice and clean because I'm an idiot. Anyway, all right. Here is another one inch piece. And that one. I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to cut two more, one more one inch piece. And that will give me something about that wide, which I think is probably what I'm going to need for my inlay. So let me get one more one inch piece cut on here. And I'll get this glued up. All right, so now, just like before, even though it kind of looks like, you know, it's like the same board and stuff, um, I've got these different widths. So when you're looking at the end grain, it will give different effects on there. And then I will turn them different ways. Uh, that's round, that's up, that's, uh, I'm going to turn this one this way, I think. I'm just looking at ways I can make the end grain kind of look similar from side to side. And actually, I'm going to use this one over here. Um, and that's something a lot of people don't take into consideration when they're doing this, especially when they first start, is like they don't really look at their end grain patterns too much to figure out which way they should be turning things. Um, actually, I think I want this one out here and this one, this way, this way, this way, okay. All right, so that's my ingrain right there. When I get these and flip them and stuff, it'll kind of make a cool pattern. Um, so we're gonna come back over to my router table to do the glue up for this because that's just where glue ups happen. So I'm gonna just take this and set it over here and I'll move the camera over there so you can have a little bit better view of that. Whoa, sorry, that was really fast. I didn't mean to do it that fast. Actually, you weren't even watching. Holy crap, I didn't change the camera angle. You should have said something. I didn't even change the camera angle. There we go, sorry. Sorry about that. I get, I get kind of caught up in what I'm doing and forget to change camera angles at times. Let me move this out of the way. Okay, so we're back to glue up. So let me get some clamps again. Oh, get the big Bessies out here. Big Bessies. Okay, and then this one we'll use. I'm gonna glue tape these up real quick so I can keep them clean. These are actually my newer Bessies, so I really don't want these to get messed up. My other ones I kind of abused a little bit. I didn't really take the time to tape them as much when I, after I first got them. I was just excited to have really nice parallel clamps because um, I'd done everything with pipe clamps before, which pipe clamps are great too, but it was just nice having parallel clamps, especially when you're doing big panels and stuff. I use a combination usually, like pipe clamps and, but the parallel clamps are just super nice to have and expensive. And I didn't take care of them like I should have. Anyway, all right. Got that there. That's nice. Let me put my little up, get the little table things there. Okay. I just like to put it this way against my fence because it gives me a nice backstop 
that I can push these against and kind of keep them square and straight. And I'm going to flip these up. You're going to glue them. And then come tomorrow, I'll have another panel. All right. Get some glue on here. Hopefully this all works out. It's in my head. It looks awesome. <laughs> it doesn't always equate to, uh, to the, it working out, but in my head, it looks fantastic. So, um, I just have a picture in my head of how this is going to work. Um, so we're going to use this walnut in grain as an inlay to the maple in grain that we just did. Um, and then that way it can be used as a cutting board because it's going to be, the inlay and the board will both be walnut. Okay, I used a lot of glue on here, so this is going to get messy really fast. Ugh. I used way too much glue on this one. I was much more sparing on the, on the maple, but this is ridiculous. That's wasteful. Just wasteful, Jeff. All right. Certainly going to have a lot of glue in the joint, though. No question about that. Way too much glue on that joint. Holy crud. Hang on a second. I'm going to drip this all over the place. Oh, my God. What was I thinking? I just went to town. I was like, you know, I didn't quite use I should have used a little more glue on that last one. I think I overcompensated just a little bit. This is the first of these type of things where I've done where I haven't used alternating species of wood and stuff, where they're just the same species. I haven't done that before. Um, so that'll be interesting as well. I mean, it will have alternating species because the inlay will be walnut and the rest of the board will be maple, but. According to my plan. Oh my God, so much glue. What was I thinking? All right, here we go. Okay, if you don't have these large Bessie or uh, Jorgensen makes some as well, uh, parallel clamps. There's a couple of other brands too. I think uh, uh, Woodcraft has their own brand or whatever. But if you, this style of parallel clamps, if you don't have any of these, um, really should be on your list. If you do any sort of glue ups or any sort of panels or anything, um, these are amazing. And they come in different lengths. Uh, these are the 24 four inch length, I think. Um, but you can get them as, as large as like 50 some inches or whatever, even larger, I think. The funny thing is the cost is really in the mechanism. Um, if I was to get a larger set, like the 36 inch or whatever, it's like $5 more or something like that. It's really not that much more expense. The expense is all in the mechanism itself for the, the head and the, the clamping portion of it. So I think that's where most of the expense lies when you're buying these things, because I, I compare the different lengths of them and you would think, oh, it's going to be a lot more for one that's really long, but it's really not. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, you're really paying for the, the clamping mechanism. And then the, the additional length of clamping rod is minimal to the cost. All right. That was a lot of glue. <laughs> Get it all off my fingers. Okay. Ew, it's kind of seeping through the towel. That's how much glue there was. All right, I'm going to try to get this straight on one side over here. Um, I can just actually, you know what? Just do. Watch this. I'm going to just do this, push all these so that they are all flush against this board right here. 
I'm just trying to get at least one kind of flat squared up edge over here is all I want. About like that. Just so one side is square. These are pretty close, so it shouldn't be too much of a deal. I'm gonna go ahead and just moved in. That. And you know what I'm gonna do? Before I actually <laughs> before I actually clamp these down, I know I use so much glue that I'm gonna get like a, a river of glue squeezing out underneath. So I'm just gonna take a paper towel and slide it underneath there so that I can sort of hopefully catch some of that as it comes out the other side here. All right, I'm gonna just slowly start putting some pressure on these. Hopefully they will not shift. Little shifting, hang on. This is the biggest problem is keeping them from shifting while you're clamping. They do want to be shifting. All right, really? Okay, hang on. Good grief, oh my God, this thing unscrewed all the way? Get out of here. Stupid thing, all right, let me get this. This one, still shifting on me, here we go. Stop shifting. Ugh. All right. Ah, lost my bite. That almost never happens. There we go. All right. I've got a lot of squeeze out, which means I've got good contact there all the way across. The other thing I'm gonna do is put another clamp on here. I am going to tape this clamp up just like I did the last one. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to use this one long ways or sideways on here. So it clamps with the wider part of the foot going across. And it's just kind of a nice way to uh, give some additional clamping pressure on the middle. But that means I need to tape the side of this thing so that I keep the glue off of here. All right, a little bit of blue tape. We're in good shape. Okay, let's get this last one on here and then this will be ready to sit in the corner. So there we go. So I've got the blue tape on here. So when I put it down, it's going to uh, sit on the glue surface and not interfere with, uh, with my, uh, my thing there getting glue all over it, it won't ruin the, the teeth. But I'm gonna give this a nice squeeze here and squeeze all around. And <laughs> uh, you can see I got a good squeeze out, right? And this is why I put that down on the table there because I knew that would happen. I just got a couple spots that it missed. All right, and I'll come back in about 30 minutes and uh, with a scraper and just scrape all of this stuff off of here because I've got a lot of it running down. But if I try to do it now, it's just gonna make a mess. If I just let it run, uh, if I come back with a scraper in about 30 to 45 minutes, it'll solidify to the point where it scrapes off really easy um, and it's not gonna be rock hard. So that makes life a lot easier. And then you have a much cleaner surface when you're ready to actually take it out of the clamps and start flattening it again. Okay, turn that off, take the headphones off, cause wow. And I think, yeah, it's about 140. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stick a pin in it. That was actually a pretty good day. Got a lot done. We uh, got this thing glued up. So got the handle glued into the punch, the handle that I made made the little stamper thing. We got the serving board. Uh, we got that cleaned up and we got the first thing of finish applied for that. We got all the boards cut for the maple 
ingrain board and all the boards cut for the walnut ingrain board. So that was a lot of stuff getting done today. And I think, uh, I think that's probably enough for right now because a lot of this stuff I really can't progress on. Um, I mean, I've got to let the finish dry. I've got to let the, the glue dry. So pretty much I'm, I'm at a standpoint where, you know, I'd have to start a new project at this point and I'm not really wanting to start a new project right now. So I'm going to start a lunch project because that sounds like a good deal. So anyway, um, anything else going on that I need to know about? Nope. I think uh, Wednesday when I come back, I will, I might pull those out tomorrow. It depends. I might pull those out of clamps tomorrow and just get them kind of flattened out. And then I can run them through the planer and get them flat so that come, come Wednesday, we can um, cut them, flip them and re-glue them again. And then I will work on my table, my uh, coffee table while those things are glowing up because um, it's just going to take a long time for that to get done anyway. That's the only thing about doing doing ingrain cutting boards is that you've got so much glue time. You've got two different glue sessions that you have to, you have to do the long grain glue up and then you have to cut them, flip them, arrange them, and then do the ingrain glue up. And those two things take a while. And then the third thing that takes a long time is the flattening. After you've done the ingrain, that is a nightmare. Um, although do I do love my new sander. It does, it does make fairly quick work of flattening now. I'm pretty impressed with it, but. Anyhow, hey, thanks for uh, stopping in, everybody, and uh, sharing a little time with me today. I really appreciate it. And if you've got time, come back on Wednesday. I'll be here. I stream from 11 to 1.30, 1.45, something like that. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I'm pretty consistent. I don't miss a lot of days. Um, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday, usually right here. So if you can come back, I'd appreciate it. And otherwise, have a fantastic rest of your week because it's Monday. So go out there and kick some butt and come back and see me. And till then, take care.